Welcome, Corey, to the Confluence podcast. I've been looking forward to this one, kind of near and dear to my heart. Corey and I have known each other for a long time and uh, have a long-standing professional relationship. And uh, when he's in town visiting, he stays with me at my house. So it's we're 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 been good buddies for a long time. But um, yeah, today uh, we're looking forward, Corey, to uh, learning about your work on this Fovia application and its development and how this all came about. Just as a um, for the audience, there's been a lot of close work that ArcVision, the company that Corey uh, runs, has been working closely with Avail. We call them sister companies. Uh, and, and we've been doing a lot of integration of, of what Corey's going to show you directly into the Avail application. So, uh, Corey, maybe you can just give everybody a, a, a kind of an intro to what Fovia is about. Thanks for ha having me on, Randall. I appreciate it. And I always enjoy talking with you guys um, about everything we're doing here. Um, and Evan, good to see you. Um, yeah, you too. Yeah, so Fovia as of today is a 3D model configuration platform that's part of our ArcVision ecosystem. And uh, we uh, can basically bring in 3D models and data sets, scan, scan data um, from outside sources into uh, the Fovia application and publish those assets back out into various file formats uh, for consumption in many different 3D applications. Revit being our key, SketchUp, Rhino, Blender, a handful of applications. Um, and it's uh, a tool really designed around democratizing 3D content and uh, assets and helping people to build, or firms to build their asset libraries up in a big holistic uh, way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's the, the nutshell about Fovia. Um, I can say that uh, when we started this effort, we had really no plans to build exactly what we were building. Um, but uh, it, it evolved in, in based on customer needs, customer requests, and uh, also just really uh, feeding off from the technological relationship between Arc Vision and Avail, and try and integrate in different pieces of our technology with Avail to make just really great customer experiences around content, content creation, and content management, all um, and one from one very singular and holistic place, if you will. I think um, you know, with what I know, uh, uh, kind of insight into the Fovia app. The, uh, the thing that seems, you know, mo most, most of the time when you would, uh, want to take a piece of content and produce other formats, uh, I've seen that, you know, over the last 20, 25 years that I've been working in this industry, it's usually, you know, I would call it a dumbing down. It's usually a l least common denominator kind of of these translators into these, uh, applications. And I know Fovia, you know, Fovia is different in that. Each of those applications and different kinds of file formats that it translates to, Corey and his team have, uh, you know, they understand the native capabilities of those applications and how to move that data into those native applications and around. So maybe Corey, you can talk a little bit more about, you know, what all went into that. Um, you know, even just more about your background, you know, on the computer graphics side and uh, how that's played into uh, really understanding this problem at a deeper level. Yeah, sure. So, you know, practice architecture for years and uh, really was quite focused on the visualization side of uh, practice. And uh, I always said we were, we had visual information modeling before BIM was BIM. We were really mm -hmm. trying to kind of use visualization as a way to describe and show building design process and outcomes as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And as part of that process, we built some technology. Um, originally, started working on a product called V-Ray for Rhino, V-Ray for SketchUp, V-Ray for Revit, back in two thousand four, and we got deep into the inner works of of geometry, materials, 
lights, all this stuff really super early on and try to get information converting from SketchUp into uh, V-Ray file format as an example, or Revit into uh, the V-Ray file format. And so we just, we learned a lot about the um, applications APIs to be able to take the material from SketchUp at the time in 2005, what you could get out of SketchUp for a material definition, um, you know, a base color and maybe a texture map, but we weren't getting type of, you know, detailed information about the materials like reflection values, refraction values, and stuff like that. We SketchUp didn't have that information and uh, delivering their, their API. But on the other hand, Revit did. So we had information coming from Revit to be able to build really accurate 3D models from these applications into, at the time, it was very strictly V-Ray, uh, V-Ray assets, V-Ray scene files and V-Ray proxy files. So that experience really set the stage for, and helped me kind of set the stage, reset the stage for RPC. And I came on board in whatever it was, 2019 on, at ArcVision, you know, the main purpose for me, at least, in my mind at the time and vision was like, hey, there are still problems with content out there in the world. People don't get enough content. People don't have enough 3D models to access and get them in their project and inform their designs or, or explain their designs. So our Arc Vision just seemed to be this platform where we could take these RPC, this RPC technology and ultimately just transform it and bring it to a whole new level. And so that experience that I had with V-Ray assets and creating scene files and trying to navigate content from one application to another served as a kind of catalyst, if you will, for what we could do with RPC. And at the time, when I stepped in the ArcVision seat here, um, I really had to dig in and understand what was what was what what was the DNA of of an RPC, and uh, came come to find out it was. Uh, as robust as it was in its early days, there were a lot of things that were not in the RPC that needed to be there, like real materials for different objects and, you know, inside of a 3D model. It was, the RPC was designed to essentially either be image-based where you had uh, 360 or more images inside of an RPC and depending on the camera, it would actually pop up an image uh, and render that image at that time, or in a 3D model or 3D RPC, it was a mesh with, uh, or meshes with textures baked on top of it. And the whole process of even getting those 3D RPCs was, was pretty cumbersome. I mean, we using three studio max, going through a bunch of very technical things, uh, steps to get to, uh, an R a 3D RPC and get it out to the you know, to your user base. And so really, as I stepped into this role, you know, I try to understand, like, we, we don't want architects and designers learning all this technical stuff. We really want to be able to kind of come back down to the heart of what RPC and Randall and ArcVision designed, which was like ease of use, drag and drop, get everything inside of that file and just make it easy for people to, to consume that piece of content and render period. So I mean, we had to do a lot of dissecting of the RPC's file structure and technology, uh, and then rebuild on top of that. And so uh, looking at all these lessons learned with V-Ray file formats and, and um, other you know file for formats like FBX or OBJ and uh, Colada files and things like that, uh, coupled with uh, looking at how Mental Ray was doing things and how Corona Render and all these other rendering engines were producing materials, geometry, how was all this stuff transporting around? We had a lot of research to pull together to try to come up and say, we want a, a really new single source of truth of technology underneath the RPC file format. So, Corey, can you explain what an RPC is for those who don't know? I'm sure almost everybody who's listening to this or watching this has seen one, but they maybe don't 
tie those two things together, what they see with RPC. Sure. So RPC is a file format. Uh, R, the R stands for rich photorealistic content is the acronym. And uh, these are assets that started out really just entourage, cars, people, trees. Uh, the RPC families ship with Revit as an example. So all the planting uh, elements that you can get out of the box of Revit are all RPC files. And uh, yeah, simple, simple description. And, and basically what you're seeing on the screen is like a, a very low resolution proxy of when you render, it's going to look better than that, right? But it's lightweight for the sake of being lightweight in the model. And often it's like you see a, two billboards kind of intersecting each other with a with a outline around the object. So it it kind of represents a tree in that example, right? In Revit, when you place it, it has kind of a, a base to it and then two vertical billboards that represent the tree. But when you hit render, you see a tree, right? And that's the idea behind this is you have this rich content that sits behind a very lightweight geometry presentation in the model. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the whole idea. Randall and I like to say it. Uh, an RPC is a proxy for a future transaction. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's there. It doesn't overburden your your CAD package, whether it's SketchUp or Revit or Rhino or whatever. The RPC is in there as a as a placeholder. Uh, and as soon as the renderer hits that RPC, it'll uh, it'll pull out the geometry, the material DNA, if you will, and render that in in its photorealistic, the full photorealistic beauty. Cool. And content's always been the hardest thing for architects to have to deal with. I mean, this is a conversation we've all had over the years, right? Which is like we build models of buildings, but putting the stuff in those buildings for the visualization, for the space planning has always been difficult. Where do you find it? Is it the right quality? Is it too detailed? Is it not detailed enough? Is it made by the manufacturer? Is it the right dimensions? And this has always been hard. And I, you guys have been at the forefront of content or assets or entourage, like all different words that we could kind of interchangeably use here. And so that that's where the the value proposition is for what you're doing, right? Is democratizing the creation of and cataloging of so that firms and you know practicing architects, people doing visualization, have access to these things at their fingertips to throw into their model because then it allows you to focus on building the model, right? Not not curating and texturing and creating these. Yeah, and I'll throw I'll just throw in because I was obviously involved with this in the earliest stages and you know the the people in the trees, the technique that was developed uh, uh, kind of underlying that technology was thrown at the tough problem of organic things like people and trees, right? Where, where you've got very complex geometry potentially very complex right. materials and textures to make that look real. So, you know, in its early days, it served its purpose in helping, you know, the industry to, uh, you know, when that first came around, there wasn't any, there was, there really wasn't any other good way, good way to do that. Yeah. And especially at, at no, you, you would load one human or one tree model from Onyx Tree, for example, right. back in the day, and it would have more polygons than your entire architectural yep. model, right? Yep. And it would just absolutely kill back then when computing performance was, <laughs> was very limited at that point. Right. So, I mean, the, the idea here. Yeah. Was and I brilliant. think the, um, yeah. uh, I, you know, I think though that the, the DNA of that technology and which is what made it, you know, very special when Corey came, you know, and brought even more, uh, I'll say broad visualization platform knowledge to it. Um, the underlying technology had really concentrated on how, how do you store lots of different kinds of data, not just geometry, but material information and texture mm -hmm. information. How do you package that? That's where the RPC file format came in so that, so that it wasn't a bunch of loose, you know, I call it loose content. You didn't want JPEGs over here that were, you know, now not right. in the same path and they didn't render because a texture was missing and all that. So there was. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was, as Corey said, that was all about, you know, how do you make this stuff easy? The way you make it easy is try to just yeah. not, not let a mistake, you know, even occur. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. and then, you know, the other piece of that, I think, you know, in the early days was, um, that content needed to be able to be rendered in lots of different rendering engines and applications. So 
there was a long history of ArcVision, the company, having uh, relationships with all of the rendering, the people doing rendering engines. So, and getting that kind of baked in there and supported uh, kind of natively. And as Corey said, even, you know, with Autodesk, I think they began shipping that, Corey, what, 2010 or 11, whenever the tree and foliage like solution yeah. started shipping with Revit. So it's always been kind of in the DNA to do all that. I think what's, you know, special about what Corey's been doing now is, you know, one, I'll just say modernizing the definition of the storage of that information inside the file and, and those capabilities. But then, you know, looking at, you know, can you, um, you know, maybe Corey, you can talk a little bit more instead of having to have those companies, um, support the RPC file format in some special way, what, uh, the team at ArcVision has been doing with the Fovea application is saying, look, we can store it, all this data in its highest form, but we can spit it out into a native form that that application wants to without losing or dumbing down quality. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of the opposite instead of everybody trying to consume one file format. It's like, look, can we get the highest level of information and then map that and translate it into the native formats that each of those applications wants to know. So if you're trying to use it in Inkscape, yeah, it's going to know what to do, or if you're going to use it in V-Ray or one of these others. So. Give each package what it is expecting. Before you do that, Corey, I just can we just share like how many nightmares we've had where we've sent the job to the render farm overnight or for days at a time to come back and find that that one material, that one diffuse material or that one bump map or whatever was not there, yeah. right? <laughs> oh my gosh. And you have to do the whole thing again, right? I, I, we've we've all been around long enough to, to live that. There's a lot of complexity. And, and, that, and that wasn't um, discriminatory in any way. Like, didn't matter what the file name was or the file size or what the texture map was for. If it was missing, it was missing and it broke everything, right? Yeah. So, or some weird character in a file yeah, name sure. or something like that. It yeah. was just like the littlest things. And it was like, oh my gosh, it was a learning experience every yeah. time. And it's still to this day, right? You can download, uh, manuf you know, see the manufacturer content all the time, pull down a Revit family you know, from a manufacturer. Geometry will come in, right? It's in that RFA right. file. Missing text. But as soon as you hit render and you yeah. hit the rendering engine, it's like missing these maps. It's like, why did, you know, one, maybe they didn't even come down with that file off, you know, it was zipped up right. or something. So there's just, there's just still a lot of complexity in the industry around this. And, uh, you know, but maybe Corey, you can talk more about what you're trying to do with the Fovea, you know, and that's sitting in the avail application. Yes. So kind of kill a couple birds with one stone here. And if I zoom out just a little bit and just talk about the other part of RPC, which is, yes, there's a the content, but the, the technology that's, that Randall, you were alluding to, like, well, there's an API, a C++ API behind RPC. And originally that C++ API is what our, um, our partners were using. So folks that on the Revit team or, or, um, you know, there was Luxology, um, and a handful of other vendors, MicroStation, you know, we had those companies coming and working with us using our APIs at that level to build integrations into their applications to support RPC. And part of, you know, my approach with this was to, again, even try to look at the platform, the, the programmatic platform that we had and figure out and try to design something that could become much more friendly web-based uh, web API based stuff as an example um, more accessible people might be able to see someday see RPC as, as an, in an open source format and be able to use Python and other languages to be able to use our platform in general and so not just you know, I wasn't, I'm not just looking or haven't been just looking at the content as being democratized, but also the technology that wraps around everything we're doing. And part of our journey was at the beginning was we had to take RPC technology from what used to be ArcVision called ArcVision dashboard, which was a content manager specifically designed for delivering RPCs from the cloud to users before cloud was cloud, probably. Um, 
and take that experience and uh, keep as much of it intact as we could and bring it into Avail and integrate our content delivery, uh, everything from thumbnails to the downloads into preview, being able to preview the models, all that we had to build a bunch of different technologies around our APIs and start to democratize the C++ stuff into other languages so that uh, we could talk with Avail, right? And that started the, the really the, in my mind, that's where we started to have to build the foundation of Fovia before Fovia was Fovia, if you will. Um, so the data flow, the not just the geometry, not just the textures, but there was meta, there's metadata involved with all this stuff. There's special GUIDs around the, the assets so that we can track them and understand where they're going and things like that. So ultimately there was a lot of engineering around making this simple and simpler, not just from the content consumption and, and use, but really, you know, forward thinking, let's get a bunch of content creators, a bunch of main building product manufacturers involved with our APIs and be able to use them to even translate and, and deliver RPCs of their own content into Revit and Rhino and SketchUp and wherever, as opposed to the broken process, as an example, Randall, what you're talking about, downloading something from the manufacturer's site and not getting the texture maps. We can deliver and we have the platform now, you know, underneath the our ArcVision RPC technology to be able to deliver single source of truth assets and give people simple APIs to access that to um, to be able to deliver their own content. Corey, maybe you can uh, want to share your screen and can you show what uh, Fovia just ends up looking like uh, in the application? Fovia comes in three different forms right now. Um, we've got a web app version, iOS app, and then this version here, which is inside of Avail, which is our latest and greatest. So what you're looking at here is uh, Avail Desktop. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see the Fovia window here just sitting here, and I'm going to just burst on the scene and do a quick show and tell of why is this important and what we're really what the power of a Fovia is. I can grab a model that's part of the Fovia publication and literally just drag and drop it directly into this Fovia canvas here that's embedded inside of Avail. And this, this is mind blowing to me even in that we're in a content manager and we're in an application in a content manager where we can manipulate 3D data. I can grab a material on here and whatever, let's just say we wanted that to be black and I can change some of the other material parameters in here. So we've got the full material editing capability for the asset right here and I can make that maybe more shiny and do a couple operations there. And then very simply, there's a publish button. I can give this a name. This is where I start to put some metadata on this asset, chair, whatever. Give it a furniture category, add a tag. And um, let's just uh, modern as an example enter and i won't get in the weeds on this at just at this very moment but this is what we were talking about earlier um where the rpc has a, a proxy representation and as part of the publishing process you've got you have the opportunity to choose different um proxy mesh uh, meth methods and what the representation will be in your cad package uh you can even do some uh downsampling of textures and mesh amplification and optimization here. So if we know this asset's going to end up in Enscape or something like that, and we need to do some decimation on this, uh, we can, let's say, make this uh, uh, target mesh count down to 6,300 uh, and change triangles, and I can hit publish. Um, so we're grabbing this this 3D data, the instructions behind it, sending it up to our cloud services through our APIs um, and publishing that piece of content. And what's great about the integration that we have with Avail is that piece of content is going up into the cloud 
processing, metadata is being stored. And at the com point that the processing is completed in our in our uh, in our web services, we'll now push and synchronize that piece of content directly into um, this this fovea channel that's sitting here in a veil. So I'm not just making content and editing or creating content in a veil through the fovea lens. I'm actually also putting it in a managed state right away. Okay. So what's important about that is, okay, if I built the asset, uh, maybe from my web browser and I downloaded it to my C drive, does anybody else in your company have access to that asset? Maybe if you save that from your C drive to a network drive, a network location, a shared location that everybody has access to. But in this case, we're, you know, we were very, very focused on, again, ease of use and trying to make sure that this content is, is in a managed state for users to be able to just not even have to think about. It's, it's here. They can search for it. They can just drag and drop it into Revit and go, period. You were talking about the Avail and, and talking about these as lenses. Uh, on the Avail platform, we have a plugin architecture to Avail that's allowing third parties like ArcVision to build on top of the Avail as a content management platform. And we call it our plugins lenses. So when he talks about Fovea as a lens, it's a plugin inside. So it's, it's ArcVision's technology that's running, you know, on top of this core content management platform, which allows them to, allows ArcVision to concentrate on this high value added capabilities without having to go rebuild over and over again, a, you know, core content management capability. So as those assets are being published, they're coming right back into the core application tagged, managed, ready to go, as opposed to being downloaded from another service that happened to be reorganized somewhere. It's kind of all one-stop shop. Yeah. And, and just to point out that this, um, our first kind of step into this was actually being able to build a, a model viewer, a previewer, if you will, that got embedded inside of Avail uh, early, pretty early on. And so people want to see what they're going to drag and drop into Revit, a Rhino or SketchUp beforehand. And so you can select, you know, piece of content and preview that model in our little preview window here. And that, that actual canvas here is the backbone of what we're using in Fovea. So this is the same 3D canvas that we have uh, in Fovea, just minus, you know, the interface uh, for controlling the finer details of, uh, of publishing and, and so on and so forth. So this was our, our first step into building and integrating s some technology into Avail um, before we jumped into the Fovea realm of being able to now edit this content. I'll zoom back out here real quick just to go back to the kind of bigger picture of what's 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 getting produced, what's Fovea really you know doing, and why, and so on and so forth. So when I publish that chair and it goes up into our cloud, we're spinning off. Um, a bunch of different file formats out of this. We, yes, we make the RPC and we make the RPC first. That file form, that single source of truth fi file format is our, you know, first stop. The next stop along the way is we, um, we actually rely a lot on uh, GLTF to transport and help us migrate data uh, into some of these other file formats that you see, but we have uh, direct jobs uh, behind the scenes where we're taking that RPC and we're getting RPC to GLTF and RPC to Datasmith and RPC to uh, FBX and, and USD and pure Enscape asset, for instance, or um, VRA, VRA Steam file as an example. So all of these file formats and file types are spun out of the single source of truth of what the RPC is. Um, we specifically kind of touch on what Randall was saying earlier, like RPC contains the richest 
form of data uh, and information and uh, textures and all that geometry and textures and all that inside of that RPC. And now we can, can repurpose any of that information into these different file formats through our, through our API, basically. So that's what Fovea is doing. It, ultimately, it'll, it it's just spit, spits out a bunch of different file formats. And this is, you know, departure from RPC and in, in main kind of way of looking at it, which was we really, we could have just kept building RPCs and relying on our C++ APIs to have partners build plugins or integrations with RPC files. Um, but really, we started to lean on this idea of this proxy as, uh, sorry, RPC as a proxy for a future transaction. And so the way we see this is an RPC may come into an application like Twinmotion. And when it comes into Twinmotion, it may come in as just the, the billboard representation that was the preview that you saw inside of your Revit file. Um, but what's slick about what, uh, what we've done is literally with a find and replace, we can grab a Datasmith version of that same asset and swap it out in twin motion so that you get apples to apples, the same car, person, tree, or whatever the asset was that you placed in Revit and that you might've been rendering with Enscape or V-Ray in Revit. Um, if your team happened to switch over to use twin motion and they, they would get with a little bit of, you know, workflow involved, they would be able to get the same apples to apples, the same car, the same trees, the same people coming out with the same materials as, as the folks were getting on the V-Ray render team inside of Revit. So maybe you can dig into that a little bit more, Corey, you know, just the, uh, the, the reality that inside of a lot of firms the workflows, the, the modeling workflows from design to visualization and back, right? Back and forth. It's not always a linear process and everybody's going back and forth that, um, you know, just how that understanding drove the need to then have these different um, representations of the same thing kind of readily available. And maybe before you jump in, Corey, I mean, this is something that's come up on, on, Troxel podcast many times, and I, I just saw Ian Keo of Hypar tweet the same exact sentiment, which is like we used to use design software to document decisions that had been made, and now we're using them to make decisions along the way because things are happening in real time. And to Randall's point here, it's like you're you're looking at the design in Enscape in real time or in twin motion in real time you're visualizing what you're drawing what you're modeling and drawing and the ramifications of those things spatially in, in all the different ways how how it makes you feel how you emotionally react to it and it drives the design it's not like the end of the process anymore right so yeah. like just to reinforce what Randall's saying like i i'm seeing this these tools are now moving way earlier in the pipeline. They're not just the end of the sentence anymore. They are the end of the phase, right? There, there is this feedback loop that is that is happening, and so these things need to be all bidirectional. Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, my my early days of working in at this point it was at Air St. Gross Architects and Planners in Baltimore, and being in the middle of the studio there. Um, servicing all different departments from interiors, landscape designers, and you know, building studios. We had to get information from the design teams and designers into a place. Uh, in our case, it was at that time it was it was Three Studio Max, and produce the visuals, but also at the end of it, be able to translate what we put in the visuals back to the design team so the design teams could document what we put in the visuals, right? And that still exists today. I mean, this is still happening. And Enscape does a great job with this for folks nowadays where they can design and visualize at the same time and they can have things consistent and they're, it's kind of, you know, not as uh, disjointed of a process as the older traditional, you know, design model or uh, design documentation to a 3D modeler specialized in Max producing something and then the design team interacting with 
what was going on in the visualization development in Max, and then <laughs> trying to again, what do you do with it? How do you get that information back? So my you know my sentiment behind RPC and and one what really drove me to take the bull by the horns on RPC is we can we can make this just this connection between the asset in the design world, the asset in the visualization world, and hopefully someday be able to make that connection back from the visualization world back into the design world. So an RPC in twin motion, or maybe let's say even further down the line in, in the Epic stream, uh, maybe you're in uh, Unreal Engine and, and with our Unreal uh, plugin, RPC plugin for Unreal Engine, placing RPCs in inside of Unreal Engine and uh, ultimately be able to translate back to the design team, back to the folks that are in Revit or Rhino or SketchUp or multiple applications, you know, designing, um, which happens as we know. Um, if I need to get, or what I ideally will happen is you'll be able to synchronize the RPCs that were placed inside of Unreal Engine with the Revit model or the Rhino model or the SketchUp model, for instance, all through, you know, our connections, either APIs um, or plugins or Avail. I mean, we'll be able to really hopefully bring this, yes, bi-directional, but interactive. Well, one, and Corey, I'll just jump in. One of the favorite examples that uh, that I know that you've been working on with some, some companies kind of closely, um, as an example, you'll have a design team working in Revit on uh, the art, I'll just call it the architectural components, but you might have a landscape design team working primarily in Rhino, a completely separate design application. Those, those models have to come together, right. Uh, to be visualized and by, you know, vice versa, the, the, the people working in Revit want to see the building in context with the landscape and then the landscape firm terraforming and entourage and anything else that might be going on on that front might be primarily being driven out of Rhino need to be able to see the context of the building in that context. Part of what I've seen Corey and the team being able to do is to show that, Hey, you can, you can take the entire Revit project, right? No matter what scale and shove that into say an RPC file format. Most people think about it as just a chair or, or a single element. You can take the entire building and its textures and materials into one file format that then knows how to render in Rhino. Well, now you get one proxy object that represents the building over in Rhino that the uh, landscape team, right, is able to see. And when they hit render, it flows into the rendering engines and they can see it. So maybe I'm still in the thunder, but Corey, maybe you can talk just a little bit more because those are very powerful, complex things where those teams are respectively working with each other, but that stuff needs to come together and be visualized all along the way. Yeah. I mean, the, the big, one of the bigger projects that I worked on uh, back in the day was really re heavily reliant on being able to aggregate different data sets into one master file and um, be able to produce a animation or a video or a film of, of you know, 10, 30 buildings in a urban context, as an example. And those workflows that we went through back then were very similar to what we're kind of being able to do now with the RPC, which is create a proxy, create a, a container file, bring those proxies into the container file, hit render, and voila, you've got proxies from an outside source into the container file, which is maybe in, like you said, Rhino, or it could be in SketchUp. And you pretty quickly can get uh, all all these data sets in and literally back out in, in a very fluid way. I had no idea that you could shove an entire project into an RPC gonna, file. We'll have to and... show you, Evan, um, you know, that we're, some of this is some of the uh, Fovia app has integrated uh, AR capabilities into it. So mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's pretty slick. You can take, I can be in Revit and I can, I can hit a button and click one button, 
shove an entire project. I did it with this new sample project, right? That, uh, that, that Harlan, uh-huh. uh, you know, that we did the podcast with earlier, literally within right. a minute, you've got that entire project shoved through Fovia and I could pull it up on my app and pull it up in AR and place it and walk through it nice. at full scale, like in the back parking lot and be walking around inside that building. And, um, uh, it's, yeah, you can, you, you can shove individual objects or entire projects through this pipeline and it, uh, it all works seamlessly. It's a paradigm shift because I mean, we've always known RPC to be these objects in the scene, right? And so you're basically talking about changing users' mindsets here too about what RPC can do and what it's used for and the different use cases. And so as a developer, those are the kinds of things I assume you're also thinking about when it comes to how you market this and talk about it and reset expectations around something much bigger than anybody is kind of coming at it just expecting it to be the next small iteration on something that's been around for quite a long time. This episode is made possible with support from Chaos Enscape. This is the perfect time to set good intentions and resolutions for the months ahead. Whether you aim to solve your design challenges faster, run your projects more smoothly, make quicker decisions, or share immersive walkthroughs with the click of a button, here's some good news. You won't need any resolutions. Chaos Enscape has the best 3D workflow solution. Chaos Enscape is the industry-leading real-time visualization plugin that is 100% fast, 100% easy, and fully integrated into your favorite design tools. It is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. Starting today, you can get a 20% discount on fixed and floating annual licenses. Just head to chaos-enscape.com and use code RES24 at checkout. That's chaos-enscape.com using code RES24 at checkout to supercharge your design workflow. Thanks to Chaos Enscape so much for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah, so this is, for instance, that's the um, the Snowden Towers project. Snowden Towers. Right? So nice. This is, you know, we're not trying to visualize and render something. This is the asset, right? So now we can take this as an RPC, whether it's um, a bounding box of this or uh, a simplified mesh or the old billboard file, so, uh, sorry, style of RPC, we can drag and drop this inside of Revit and start, or sorry, Rhino, the source is Revit, bring this into mm-hmm. Rhino or SketchUp and start, you know, designing a new building on that parking lot right there. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or, you know, just to emphasis on the, the phobia, that could be that very same source model that started in Revit with all the materials and textures can now be available in USD or brought into data Smith right into one of the game engines or somewhere else. So, and, uh, but nice. there's a connection between all of those. So you can kind of bi-directionally, you know, get back to the right native format that you want, right. In, in whatever application that you're wanting to, you know, work in. So does this become a link that, that design teams, we all know you guys have been in visualization forever, right? That the design doesn't stop. Right. When you send the model to the visualizing guys, the, that's just the latest version. It's not the it's not the, the where it's going to end. And, and is there a way to to that this kind of helps solve that problem, which is like, no, I really need your final model on Tuesday. That's the last day that I'll, I can accept your final model. Does this give people the ability to kind of continually work up to that deadline in in less of a export import kind of a manner? Uh, it still, still will be an update kind of, kind of a workflow, right? I mean, someone can write out the new, the final version of that building or design and, uh, user in Rhino or SketchUp or whatever would have to update that RPC and, and that data set inside of that application. So there is, okay. there is still a, you know, a, some workflow involved, but we're not talking about you know, having to redo all the materials and rebuild all the, you know, the lighting and so on and so forth. What gets brought in with the RPC is what was where the project was left off and and say Revit in this case. Let me me inject, Corey, just so to make sure. But 
yes, it requires a human to do it, but it's, I can tell you, but you know, haven't used it in Revit, it's one button click and you're, and that's it. It's like in, in, in nice. 60 seconds, yeah. the thing is out there and able to be consumed on the other end. What I'll say about, you know, what ArcVision is working with Avail on part of Avail's platform is, you know, now that's a piece of content. Well, now imagine that the, that, that, that piece of content is in an application, the Rhino or Revit. Part of what Avail's working on is the ability when something has been updated, the content gets updated. Can it either push a notification that to the user, Hey, there's a new version of this available. You Do you know. want to update it? Uh, so now you can imagine these right. bi-directional workflows where different people working on different parts and you want that stuff to come together. We're doing that from the standpoint of thinking about like a manufacturer updates a piece of information mm -hmm. and you want to send, you know, you want that to be, um, yeah. people who are using that piece of content to know that there's an updated version of it. But I also think that it's laying the groundwork for that. You know, you could be on a nightly basis, you know, publishing the updated version of the Revit model for the day. And then as everybody comes into yeah. work the next day, they're receiving the next updated version and, you know, moving along with their work. So it's not, you know, the, 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 the framework's there right now. People are manually kind of pushing these things, but the, the groundwork's being laid for this to be automated in, in new ways. Yeah. And I mean, I can use an example right now, actually two in particular, um, NVIDIA's Omniverse platform as an example, it's been kind of a, a great testing bed for us. And, and we, we're going to, we'll be talking more about this in the next few months, but what that platform has allowed us to do because it's open developmentally and we can develop a lot around our current APIs and do a lot of things that we can't do in Revit specifically or Rhino specifically or whatever, because th those applications might have a lim limitations on APIs and how geometry and information comes into those applications. So in the case of Omniverse, for instance, uh, we have uh, asset store plugin that we built for Omniverse and it's really designed to be a, uh, number one, an authentication source uh, to be able to allow uh, our Vision subscriber to log in, authenticate themselves inside of that platform, and then allow them to f download their assets, which they might make through Fovia or through our subscription content. But what's going on is in, the, in Omniverse, if someone brings in a Revit file and there's an RPC in it, uh, that what we get inside of Omniverse is, again, a proxy object that's transferred from Revit, the Revit file into the Omniverse platform. We can literally, again, select that asset and request via API to swap out that asset with its twin in USD file format. So it's a targeted file format for a targeted use case in, in that application. Uh, but it's, it's center point it's reference center reference point is the RPC and the RPC GUID, right? That's really making that connection. Right. Um, and then even now, uh, literally we're I'll have a development progress meeting this afternoon. I'll show demo this integration that we're working on with blender, which again, open source uh, platform and able, super easy for us to get around uh, programmatically and build tools around and communicate with our API, with Blender's API, and literally take a Revit project, building project like Snowden here, and get it into Blender in two, two clicks and a drag and drop. I don't know if you did it, but maybe you can open up the preview panel and just show that that, you know, full model is able to be rendered, right? Even just in the web, in the web renderer, but it, it's full, but the entire project, right? Is in there with all its glory, materials, textures, and it, it's back yeah. to that. Like you don't have all this dangling information that you're going to lose. So you know, for, especially through these visualization flows. So 
So yeah, so just so I'm selecting, you know, one of the exports, if you will, or one of the translations into RPC of the Snowden project. And there it is in its full glory, this full data set. I mean, that's the biggest problem with file formats, right? Is there there's inherent data loss uh, and <laughs> there's also just kind of you loss of life of brain cells every time somebody has to open one of these FBX or OBJ or DAE dialog boxes and figure out which boxes to check or not check and, and to push these updates and to export and to import and to switch the axes and flip this and that. And what you're saying here is like we solved all that and and we've actually made it like Randall, you said one button export from Revit. That's a big deal. How much time has would think back to how much time has been spent in those dialog import export dialog boxes and how much data has been lost through those translation processes over time in the architectural field alone. It's enormous, right? And and so this this is a big deal actually. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an ongoing exercise, right? I mean, we've we've constantly have to evolve the communication of these assets across these different file formats. You know, one renderer will treat one texture map one way and another renderer will treat it completely the opposite yeah. way as an example, yeah. right? And we've got to we got to learn this, whether learn it through the artistic means that we have of having to have done it before or our users doing it daily. Um, but those are the, like the little nuances that we got to capture and figure out, okay, how does a transparency map translate differently between V-Ray and Enscape or differently between uh, Revit and Rhino? Um, we're trying to take all those complexities out of the equation. We can't hit everything with, you know, one silver bullet, but we're progressing and our APIs are progressing and communication around all that uh is progressing so at the end of the day you know we've got a work cut out for us still to to remain agnostic with the technologies that we're building so that we're not dependent on a particular renderer or dependent on a particular cad package or, or 3d package but that we can just hopefully let people share and consume and uh, build one easy, of the things uh, one of the things Evan that I've just been excited about from a veil standpoint of seeing this evolve and and you know now making its way out in the market is this idea that inside of inside of a firm especially you know a firm of any size I always refer to it as like you have people at the edges of the network you know, people at their desk working and building right in the end those are the that's where the the work's being done but the idea that as yeah. as assets or or things are created and the, the idea that they can be published centrally back into mm -hmm. the system and then democratized right through through hey i've made this in rhino but you can consume it in revit <laughs> right immediately yeah. like within 2 yeah. minutes that i've yeah. pushed this back in so i have this um I think that that's where this can be, at least initially, that people will see a, a lot of the value out of it is, hey, we can, as we're creating things, no matter which of these applications we're creating them in, if they come back through this hub and then they're made available then for anybody that wants to now consume those, you're not, you know, you're not having to rely on whoever built it to go do something and try to translate it for you. It's like, no, this is automatically being converted, not in a dumb way, but in a very smart, you know, high level way yeah. and keeping the integrity of that data as it, as it moves around. So I think there's a lot of value to be exercised or, or found and uncovered just through that uh, part of the process as well. I think also one of the things that this allows through this democratization process and through this kind of single source of truth, but, but multiple outlets is that there's a lot of tools in the toolbox and you want to be able to use the right one for the job. And that doesn't mean you're going to use the same tool on every single job. And it may even mean that there are different people on the same project using different tools to do different things. And it's nice to have the ability to pick the right tool for the job, but still know that you can get all your stuff in there. So if, if you've got a Viz person using Max with V-Ray and you've got another person doing interactive content in Unreal and you've got a designer sitting at their desk using Enscape for day-to-day -day visualization, you can still easily get the same content and models 
to all of those people in a very simple way. I mean, that, that to me is there's a huge potential there to really unify workflows, but still give choice to the people who want to be able to make that choice of what tool to use for what job. Yeah. And Evan, I mean, frankly, having that choice and being able to open people up to many choices is one of the catalysts of, you know, us breaking out of, in this case, building all every RPC ourselves, right? Like mm -hmm. originally mm -hmm. when this all started, we were, we're producing every RPC and that wasn't something that I wanted to subscribe for and, and for the company to, to commit to just creating content constantly. And so the first, you know, really the first, you know, steps into Fovia were like, Hey, wait a minute. No, let's take our old ArcVision creator technology that we had and make it more accessible, cross platform, cross device and let people have choices of which file formats they want to bring in, not just pigeonhole them into going into three studio max and doing certain workflows and getting that data out into an RPC. Like, okay, let's ex open this up as much as we possibly can. If you're a SketchUp subscriber and you swear by using, um, 3d warehouse to get your assets, but, and, and you need to get a chair from warehouse into Revit. It's two clicks from our, our setup, grab the file from warehouse, drag it into Fovia, publish it, drag it from avail and back into Revit. And you've got that chair from your, your go-to library directly into yeah. Revit. Boom, done. Right. So it, we're kind of, we try to keep our blinders off and let people use any of these options out there to create their own content. I don't want to make content anymore. So that's, you know, that was really the, one of the catalysts, right? Um, it makes a lot of sense because you're you're almost definitely not going to make the exact content that somebody needs anyway. It's insatiable. Never. So it's, it's insatiable. It right. Journey. Right. No, never. Yeah. So I, I've got, this is kind of the latest and greatest, and I'll just show um, what we're doing in Blender. Again, Blender's this, you know, open source platform, easy for us to develop around, so on and so forth. So we've built a publisher for Fovia directly in Blender. So I'm logged in. Uh, I can add a file name here, so on and so forth. I'm, I can set up my parameters just as if I was inside of a veil and fovea, like I showed earlier. Um, but you know, what I have here is now, if I'm get a scene from my blender guy, uh, I can do something like I can isolate the chat chair from that scene. Right. And I can give this a name chair can give it a category furniture chair tag um podcast as an example again i can choose my my uh, proxy type whichever way i want it to bring in uh billboard published a fovea i'm going to generate my preview of this so i got a preview thumbnail of it of, so the thumbnail goes along for the ride uh, i'll see this in avail or wherever that rpc or any of the file formats go and from here I can publish the phobia. So again, we're taking this data set, pushing it up into the, to our services, running the translations, all that stuff. I can literally now, once this is published, go grab even a dot blend file, a native blender file that we are packaging up along for the ride as the single source of truth for the original, you know, the original model. And once this is all done processing, I can literally drag and drop the same uh, Blender file, native Blender file into Blender and basically 360 degrees. Uh, I can open up that file in Fovia, edit, make edits and hit publish again. And I'll get another Blender file out and I'll be able to drag and drop that Blender file into, into Blender. So in many cases, let's say full 360 bi-directional workflow, just and this is on an asset level, but we can zoom, we can zoom out and we can do this at the, at that room level. So you could theoretically have somebody who's like a content manager or a librarian constantly be monitoring what's coming into Fovia and Avail and 
making changes in there to kind of standardize things with certain metadata or materials or looks or whatever it may be and publishing those to a content library for everybody to use. And they don't have to know Blender as an example. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. So, you know, back to, back to avail and what, what people will see. So the Fovia channel is a, is a plan level channel by design. There will have mean, to be a mother, you mean company wide. We call, we call them company plans. Plan. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Company wide plan. Yeah. And uh, what that means is there'll, there'll be a, a gatekeeper at the, at, you know, at the top of this, right. There's an administrator or publisher that will have access to all of what's coming into Fovia. And at that point, you know, you can have folks being able to approve pieces of content and get that content, um, in a, in a focused custom, uh, avail channel, if you will, um, so that folks can have their own firm wide channel. It's absolutely separate from, from phobia even. Yeah. Corey's got, Corey's got tons of stories Ray's told me about, you know, somebody's under a tight deadline. They've got a project. There's an asset that was available on turbo squid or that they found, you know, on somewhere, right. Maybe it was even on their network, but it was in the wrong file. For, it was in a different file format than whatever application they're working in, but they need it. So for them to be able to figure out how to get that content that they know is right here in hand into the right form right is very frustrating yeah. time consuming and, and ultimately oh, expensive yeah. process so i think there's yep. just a yep. ton of you know of, of real un you know uncovering all this value in hey you can just now drop that i don't even have to know anything about blender all i have to know is that this fovi application knows what to do with it and then boom here it is i can now yeah. bring that into inscape or i can bring that into revit or some other place and leverage it immediately is very powerful and again, just how much time that could potentially save, because that is an iterative process of uh, trial by fire, right? Which is like, okay, we're going to import it and see <laughs> what didn't work. And we're going to go back and we're going to check some different boxes and we're going to try again. And okay, I, I have to learn how to use this because I don't use Blender and I'm, I'm used to 3D Studio Max or whatever it is. And that is, like you said, it's an expensive proposition because you're paying staff by the hour or whatever. And what a pain. Like It's not going to work right the first time. It never works right the first time unless you're an expert in that particular file format translation process. So uh, taking all the guesswork out of that is, I think there's, that's the kind of thing that it's hard to explain that because firms don't necessarily, although they bill by the hour and they sell time for money, they don't necessarily value their own time in the ways that we're talking about here because it's just, that's how it is, right? Everybody just expects that's how it is. And when you can actually show that, okay, we, we took this thing that normally takes like literally 40 minutes for somebody to figure out how to do it right the first time because they don't use the application every day and X, Y, and Z reasons. And we made it take 20 seconds. Like that is, that's in, that's a big deal inside yeah. of a firm. Yeah. Now multiply that by how rate, you know, the, the bigger the firm, how many times is People. that happening across, yep. or across the year? Right. I can tell you guys, you know, I just got off a call and, um, the, the gentleman's trying to get assets that he scanned with his iPhone from Polycam into his Revit project. And, you know, I got him access to our iOS app beta and just did a 15 minute tour of how things work. Drag and dropped an RPC of his polycam scan from Avail directly into Revit. And, um, I, he, I mean, honestly, he couldn't believe that it was that, that easy. Um, it was, but I also couldn't believe like how well the scan data was coming in, uh, that he had captured with polycam and how powerful polycam was. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, we zoomed out before, well, before we made the iOS app and made a decision that we weren't going to get in the business of making a, a iOS scanner. And that mm -hmm. what we wanted to do was actually embrace as many of the scanning apps as we possibly could in the file formats that they deliver so that you can get those assets up into Fovia and into Revit, Rhino, SketchUp or wherever as quickly as possible. And, you know, he happened to be a Polycam user who's had a bunch of scans and he's like, I need these, this bike. 
scan this bike. I want this bike in and rev it. So the processing time was probably the, you know, the longest part or the most built up anticipation. And you're like, okay, well, well, when's it going to get here? So once it got produced and the drag and drop happened, he, his eyes just lit up. It was pretty awesome. And so is that throwing an RFA into Revit? Is it a family file? So, well, technically speaking, um, when you drag and drop the RPC into Revit, we build an RFA mm. behind the scenes that contains the, the link, if you will, to the, to the RPC. Um, so there's, there's an RFA involved. Yeah. We create it. When we create that family, we take metadata from the asset. So the tags and category of the asset and things like that. And we actually try to put out as much of that into the family as we can. And if it's a furniture piece, as an example, we make sure that, that RFA that gets made is actually a rabbit family, a uh, furniture family not just a you know generic um entourage family as an example right so nice we try to try to do that we can't do that for every revit category because the way things are in revit at the moment but i know in the future we'll be able to do something pretty slick um around that uh to be able to keep keep these uh, these assets pushed into the right revit category as an example i recently did a polycam scan and brought that model into rhino and even then, it, it was the first time I've done it, and it because I, I Black Friday dealed the Polycam for a year this last year, right? And I, I wanted to play with it, and so I did a room scan model and brought that into Rhino, and just getting the scale right and everything is still it's still an issue, right? Like just getting stuff to show up how you expect it to just show up immediately is not how it actually works. You still need to know about the translation and the and which boxes to check and which scale to apply and what, what units are you working in in Polycam and what units are you working in in Rhino and all those things. And to make it easy is, it's a again, I just keep going back to this. It's a big deal. It saves so much time to just have it work right the first time that, that it's incredibly valuable. Yeah, and we, I mean, we take some of that, a lot of that guessing out of the equation. That Polycam scan comes in and we, in Fovia, um, I mean, I can show this. Here's a chair, right? So... There's that chair coming in from from Blender. I can preview it. Um, that's not a slouch of a model either. I didn't do any decimation or optimization of that geometry at all. So it, it's you know there's blanket there. It's been deformed in in the application, the pillow, the, the wrinkles, all that all that deformation. I mean, it comes out of cost polygonally triangles. Um, but again, we can decimate that. Um, to some degree, uh, not, you know, we don't have amazing uh, decimation tools um, that can completely rebuild all the meshes. But, um, but yeah, this is, that's a chair. Nice. And again, this is ready to just drag and drop in Rhino. Rhino so in that amount of time, there. right, you went from maybe one format, native format that was completely unavailable to you to, I can help drop this into any of the applications that I'm used to using. Yep. So when, you, when you're publishing it from Blender in this case, and you ingest it into Fovia, Fovia is making all those other versions of the, the, that you showed earlier. So the GLTF and the, the RPC and, and all those different versions. All yep. the, all the okay. Right. So then that's all, all that work all is the, done. And then all I have to do is pick what, where I want to, send it to and it's it's yeah, just going to show up of those, fairly all immediately of those formats are available immediately yeah okay yeah cool so again if you got a blender guy who's great at modeling and you your let's say visualization tool is unreal engine you can use our rpc plugin in unreal engine or you can import in a data smith file which is part of the output as an example right very cool so actually if i if i filter down through here i by our application so application unreal engine and chair um hmm. you know you can see i've got a handful of file formats that are pulled down here i've got uh, fbx obj rpc and U data smith those are all the file types that you can import into unreal engine out of the box right 
Um, so we give you the, you open up, <laughs> we open up and give you choices. If you want to bring in an FBX, by all means, if that's your workflow and that's the way you prefer to work, then grab the FBX and go. I know there's a ton more that we can get into on this, but I think we're going to uh, plan on kind of putting a wrap on this session and then follow up with maybe a deeper dive, Corey, assuming that you're willing to uh, kind of get into a little bit of the behind the scenes of some of the, uh, some of the decisions, you know, you, you started out saying that even, even where this ended up was not where you originally, you know, envisioned and, and the path kind of took, took you there in, in different ways. So, uh, maybe we can end up, uh, you know, coming back to this in another session and digging in a little deeper about what some of those decision processes were. Absolutely. My pleasure.